Hello everyone, in this video we're going to investigate diffraction from a slit of finite width. So the setup is shown in the diagram. We're going to have some wave coming in from left to right. It's going to pass through this single wide slit um, with a width of A. And we're going to put a screen somewhere over here on the right hand side and derive an expression for the intensity of the wave as it arrives on the screen. Now that intensity is going to vary with position on the screen. And so I've written down here that what we're trying to find is the intensity I as a function of theta, where theta is the angle um, defined on the diagram. Now to understand why the intensity does vary as a function of theta, in other words, why there are going to be bright spots and darker spots, you have to imagine taking your single wide slit and splitting it up into many, many little point sources, as I've tried to illustrate on this diagram. So I've just added some red lines so that it looks like we've got five beams going from different points on the slit to the given point that we're interested in on the screen. In general, I'm going to call the number of beams n. And of course, eventually we're going to be interested in the limiting case where n is infinite because, well, the space in the slit is continuous and we can split it up into infinitely many points. So because those n beams all travel different distances, as you can see from the diagram, right, the ones at the bottom are traveling more than the ones at the top, if we're focusing on that particular point on the screen, they're all going to arrive at the screen with different phases. In other words, they're going to arrive um, sort of at different fractions of the way through their cycles. And therefore, they're going to combine with each other by the principle of superposition in some complicated way to make an overall wave on the screen. So at some points, they'll reinforce each other when they're all in phase. At other points, they will interfere destructively when they're less in phase. And a nice way to deal with interference problems like this, where you're basically adding together a lot of different waves with different phases is to use phases as I have indicated down here. So that's going to be my preferred method for working through this. You don't need to use phases, but I find it quite a nice method. The first thing we want to do is work out the overall displacement due to the wave on the screen. Again, displacement could mean like the electromagnetic fields produced by an electromagnetic wave, or it could be a physical displacement of molecules if it's a sound wave, or it could be a displacement of water molecules if it's a water wave. So in general terms, we're just going to talk about displacement. And I'm going to call the displacement psi. That's the overall displacement. And according to the principle of superposition, we can add the displacements, um, taking account of their signs, plus or minus, um, of each of the individual waves that are combining. So I'm going to say psi, the overall overall psi is the sum of all of the individual displacements, which I'm going to call psi i, where i is an index that just goes from 1 to n um, and just refers to each individual beam. So when we've got um, our uh, a combined displacement, we need to use the fact that the intensity of any wave is proportional to the square of its amplitude. Now psi and all of the psi i's are complex numbers defined in such a way that um, their modulus is the amplitude of the corresponding wave and their argument is the phase of the corresponding wave. And so if we want the amplitude of the overall wave, we take the modulus of psi, in other words, the left hand side of that equation, and we just square that, right? So our intensity is going to be some constant multiplied by the squared modulus of psi. Now we need to think about how all of the different psi i's are related to each other because they are very closely related to each other because they all came from the same wave originally but they're all just a little bit out of phase. And so I've just sketched a diagram um, down at the bottom right showing two of the beams and we're making an assumption here that the screen is very far away from the slit so that the beams are essentially parallel right just visualize taking the original diagram moving the screen further and further to the right and you can see that all of those red lines would look pretty much parallel if we were to look at them at the slit now let's define the separation along the slit between the starting points of those two beams to be delta a and just to clarify where that is on the original diagram it would basically be this little distance that i'm adding at the top left delta a between any two of the beams right we're going to to make them evenly spaced. Now why have I drawn this little triangle down here with my dashed lines? Well it's because this bit here of the triangle is the extra distance that the wave at the bottom travels compared with the wave at the top. So let's say that's PD for path difference. So if we could figure out the path difference we'd be able to convert that into a phase difference. Now I've just added on my angle theta as defined originally um, just next to one of the beams there. If that's theta then this angle here that I've just marked on with an arrow is 90 degrees minus theta because we've got a right angle here. And therefore, um, the angle at the top of the triangle, this one here, is just theta. It then follows that that path difference that we're after um, is just delta A sine theta, just from trigonometry applied to that triangle. Now, how do you convert a path difference into a phase difference? Well, if we call the phase difference phi, um, we use the fact that there are two pi radians in a full cycle. We just multiply two pi by the fraction of a cycle that the path difference takes up. So we take two pi, multiply it by delta A sine 
theta divided by the wavelength of the wave, which I'm going to call lambda. And then remember that the wave vector k is defined as 2 pi over lambda. So we can neatly write that as k delta a sine theta. And because all of the individual beams coming from the slit are evenly spaced, that phi is going to be the same phase difference between any two adjacent beams. So if, for example, we define um, the, uh, the displacement due to one of the beams at the extreme ends of the slit to be phi 1, we could just write that as some arbitrary time varying complex number with a complex amplitude a um, and a, a sinusoidally time varying term e to the i omega t where omega is the angular frequency of the wave. Now how are all of the other psi's related to psi 1? Well we've just said that they all differ from the previous ones by the same phase factor phi and so if phi 1 is that well we can say that phi 2 is just the same as phi 1 but it's picked up an extra phase of phi and in complex numbers the argument um, is the phase and so we uh, just multiply by this phase term e to the i phi. Similarly psi 3 would then just be the same as psi 2 but with an extra phase of phi so you multiply by e to the i phi and so on up until we get to psi n. So now what we need to do is just add together all of those complex numbers psi 1, psi 2 all the way up to psi n and uh, it's quite nice to use a graphical method for that so we just um, draw some axes, the imaginary and real axes, the argand diagram. We represent each complex number as a vector on that argand diagram. We put the vectors head to tail and then our sum is going to be from the tail of the first vector to the head of the last vector. Each of those individual vectors in this context we just refer to as a phasor. So let's first draw on psi 1. Now what do we know about psi 1? Well it has a modulus equal to just mod a because the modulus of the complex exponential term is just one and it has an argument given by omega t plus whatever the argument of the complex amplitude a is. So we can pretty much just draw that as some arbitrary vector starting at the origin um, and label what we know about it. So we know it has a length of mod a and this angle here as we just discussed is given by omega t plus the argument of a. Now let's add on psi 2. Psi 2 remember is the same as psi 1 but it's just rotated by an extra phase of phi, right? Remember in an argon diagram um, the phase is the angle um, that your vector makes with the real axis and so if it's got a phase which is phi bigger than the previous one it's just rotated by phi, uh, an angle phi anti-clockwise. So if we draw on psi 2 it's going to have the same length as that first one but it's just rotated a little bit and the angle phi just to clarify where that is is this thing here and of course this has the same length modulus of a. So I've just completed my diagram by adding five phases to reflect the fact that I had five beams in my original diagram. Remember n can be arbitrary and we want to eventually consider the limit where n goes to infinity but let's just say it's five for the time being. Then we just add all of these together from the beginning of the first one to the end of the last one and we find that our result Right, the sum of all of those complex numbers is represented by that phase of that big arrow that I've just added on. Now, because we defined um, psi to be the sum of all of the individual psi i's, that vector that I've just added is psi, and therefore it has a length just given by the modulus of psi. And remember, it's the modulus of psi that we're ultimately interested in so that we can then square that and figure out what the intensity is. And so we're going to have to do a little bit of geometry to work out the modulus of psi in terms of the other parameters of the problem. And we're going to have to think about the limiting case where we get infinitely many phases adding up on our diagram. Now, what we've made is basically a polygon shape with a lot of equal sides, right? A lot of sides with length of mod a and then one big side with length of mod psi. Now, as you split your slit into more and more point sources, in other words, as n gets bigger and bigger, the amplitude produced by each individual beam would have to reduce because there's a fixed amount of intensity coming out of the slit. Now hopefully you can see that if you were to fill out this polygon with more and more sides but make them shorter and shorter, you would eventually tend towards an arc of a circle. That's going to look something like the circle that I've drawn on the right. I've scaled it down a little bit so that it fits on the screen, um, but you get the general idea. It's like this vector here is the same as this vector here, and I've just taken the limiting case so that instead of a lot of um, sides making up a polygon, we have infinitely many sides and it tends towards uh, the arc of a circle. So what do we actually know about that circle? Well at the moment we really know two things. We know the length of the chord is just the modulus of psi, so that length of the chord is what we're ultimately after. Now because each of the individual beams is producing an amplitude of a, or modulus of a, and there are n of them, 
the arc length, the length of the minor arc of that circle cut off by the chord is just going to be n times the modulus of a. So that's the curved bit. And I've just added a point in the center of my circle and labeled it c. The reason I've done that is because we can actually work out what that angle in the middle is subtended by the chord. To do that, you have to imagine what the tangent vector to the circle is doing as we move from the bottom of the chord to the top of the chord. So the tangent vector at the bottom looks something like that. And at the top, it looks something like that. We're going to make use of a couple of facts. Firstly, the angle between a tangent and a radius in a circle is fixed at 90 degrees. So there's like a 90 degree angle there and the same 90 degree angle up there. Because that angle is fixed at 90 degrees, regardless of where we are in the circle, that means the angle through which the tangent vector rotates is the same as the angle through which the radius vector rotates. Why is that useful to know? Well, we know exactly how much the tangent vector rotates by, because if we go back to our um, previous diagram on the Argan diagram, um, we said that each of the little line segments is just rotated by an angle phi relative to the previous one. If we've got n of them, then the final one has rotated by an angle n phi relative to the first one. And therefore, we can say that the angle between the two radius vectors, um, in other words, the angle at the center of that circle, is indeed just n phi. Now, what else can we say about this circle? Well, let's say the radius is r. Can we work that out in terms of the other parameters? We can, because it's a general property. If we're working in radians, it's true for circles that the arc length of a given sector um, is equal to the radius multiplied by the angle. In this case, we know the arc length, so we can work backwards and say that the radius is the arc length, which we said was n modulus of a, and we're going to divide that by the angle at the center, n phi. And the ends then, of course, cancel. And you find the radius of the circle is modulus of a divided by the phase difference phi. Now remember, ultimately, what we care about is the modulus of psi. That's why it's useful to know the radius, right? So let's think about how psi is related to the radius. Right? So modulus of psi. Well, what I'm going to do, there are a couple of ways to do this, but I am going to add a, um, a line of symmetry onto this isosceles triangle so that that is 90 degrees there. And we've made two smaller triangles, each of which has sort of a base length of modulus of psi divided by two. Now it follows from simple trigonometry that this length here is given by r multiplied by sine of n phi divided by two, because this angle at the uh, the far left of that right angle triangle is just half of n phi, right? So we then just multiply that by two um, because the red line was the, the bisector of modulus of psi. So we get two times r sine of n phi divided by two. You could alternatively, by the way, use the cosine rule, apply that to your big triangle and then use some trig identities to arrive at the same result. So let's rewrite this in a more conventional way using the fact that r is the modulus of a divided by phi. So what am I going to do? I'm going to keep my sine of n phi divided by two. I'm going to turn this into a fraction. Now because r is mod a divided by phi and we have an r as the prefactor of our sine function, there is going to be a phi on the denominator of our overall fraction. I'm also, for reasons that are going to become clear in a second, going to divide by two. This two here is the same as this two here because it's like we've got one over one over two, which is the same as just two. Now that might seem like a bit of a strange way to rewrite it, but it's gonna be obvious why I've done that in a couple of moments. So what's missing from this expression? Well, we still have a modulus of A from the expression for R, right? So we need a modulus of A to go in place of that R there. We've already taken care of the phi by putting it on the denominator. And as my final step, I'm gonna both multiply and divide by N, which doesn't do anything overall, of course. So we were allowed to do that. So I put an N there and an N there. And then we've ended up with this nice feature that the denominator of the fraction is the same as the argument of the sine function. The point of doing that is that we can then rewrite this as n times modulus of a times the sinc function. Sinc of x is defined as sine x over x. And so what we have here is exactly sinc of n phi divided by 2. Now what's the significance of this prefactor n times the modulus of a? Well that's just the maximum amplitude that you can ever get. If you picture your phasor diagram that's what you would get if all of your um, phases were lined up in phase with each other and just making one big straight line. You'd then just add n times the length of each individual line which is the modulus of a. But then to convert this into intensity all you have to do is square everything. Um, modulus of psi squared is proportional to the intensity um, n times the modulus of a squared is proportional to the maximum intensity. So we can say i equals i naught, where i naught is just defined to be the maximum intensity, which you can kind of intuitively see is going to occur at the midpoint of the screen, the point that I just circled on the diagram. So i is going to be i naught, and then we have to square the entire sinc function, sinc squared, 
of um, oh and let's put phi back in terms of the other parameters remember phi was k delta a sine theta when we multiply that by n as we have to when we put it in the argument of the sinc function you're going to have an n delta a in there however n times delta a you can see from the diagram at the top left n delta a is this the same as the overall width of the slit which is a right and so n phi is the same as k a sine theta so i get k a sine theta on the top and i've still got my over to there. So there is our expression for the uh, intensity interference pattern that you would get from a single slit of finite width. You can see it has some of the features that we were discussing earlier. In particular, um, it goes to zero for certain values of theta because the sine function itself goes to zero for certain values of theta. That's when um, the waves all interfere in just the right way so that they all uh, cancel each other out. Okay, so that's all for this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.